Can you imagine a man was working in a school in a Western country, but it was a Muslim school. He was a teacher there. And a lot of the other teachers were actually women. It was a girl's school, but it was a Muslim school. He expressed that he was a bit uncomfortable interacting with all these women, all the teachers. He would always lower his gaze, speak it with a very professional tone, and he would kind of keep to himself and avoid those interactions with these women because a lot of them were actually young women teachers there. They're Muslim as well. Remember this. So what happens is he goes about like this and he's trying to keep to himself and do the right thing as a Muslim, respect these women and follow the rules of Allah. And what actually happens is that they start to tell him, we feel disrespected by your behavior. We feel upset. We don't feel like you're treating us like we should be treated. And all because he's just doing one thing, which is following the guidelines of Allah when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender. And ultimately he went to a friend of mine and he said, uh, bro, is this normal? Like, you know, maybe there's something wrong with me. You know, I've got this kind of animalistic, I'm out of control. I, I can't speak to women in a normal respectful way so they don't get upset. Am I, am I the wrong one here? He was actually being shamed for being a normal man. And this is a very deep, but very common problem that we're facing today as Muslim men. I know years ago when I was on Twitter, I would actually get hints of the same feeling that I'm feeling one thing inside, but what I see from Muslims on Twitter was that I'm feeling the wrong way and they don't approve of my way of feeling or thinking. And it came to the point where I started to actually question myself. And I think this is actually the definition of gaslighting, making you question your own sanity, making you question whether the way you are, the way you think or feel is normal or not. And so this is happening on a mass scale. It happened to me on Twitter, seeing certain tweets and feeling, am I wrong? It happened to this brother working in the school. And so let's have a frank conversation about the issues that Muslim men are shamed for and what the reality is of those issues and why we should never accept this modern narrative. And we should actually be proud of the natural instincts and feelings that Allah gave us. And I can't wait to get into the third one because that story is just sad, but there's a lot of lessons to gain from it. So the first point that is used to shame us men into feeling like the way we are is not acceptable is this whole thing of we should just control ourselves. Don't look at women, no matter how they're dressed. Don't look at them. Don't disrespect them. You have to look at them and treat them like they're a normal man, pretty much. Treat them like that, but also control your gaze like at the same time. And if you don't do that, you're like this animal. You have no self-control. You're a weirdo or something. So this is the claim, but the reality is actually completely different. Allah created a certain way that we would be attracted to the opposite gender, and that's normal and healthy for us to have marriages, families, etc. But Allah also put in place certain guidelines so that we wouldn't fall into a bad way of expressing that. So that feeling of attraction is very normal. That finding it difficult to lower your gaze is normal. But then we try our best to actually lower our gaze and respect women and don't mix with women and follow Allah's guidelines. So the first thing that Muslim men are being told to be ashamed of is purely their attraction to the opposite gender. It's crazy to say that, but of course it's very natural to find attraction in the opposite gender and Allah gave that to us and it's part of our family structure even. What Allah also gave us is guidelines to channel that attraction in the right direction. The direction of showing respect to the opposite gender and getting married and not messing around with people. That is what Allah gave us. But what these people that try and shame us say is that we should be ashamed of that basic attraction. This is completely going against what we know to be natural for us. And also what Allah even says, Allah tells us to lower our gaze. The Prophet ﷺ says that I have not left men a bigger trial, a bigger fitna than women. So this is something we have to accept as Muslims straight away, that this is a struggle that we are going to have. And if you're going to dress a certain way and put your photos a certain way, then that is going to make that trial harder for us. So don't you come to us and say we're creeps or we're weirdos if you're displaying yourself fully and then we find it hard to lower our gaze. And this was the case of the brother that I mentioned before that he was being shamed for fearing this fitna, fearing this trial, and then just trying to follow Allah's guidelines. So we should not accept this. And I'm going to get into the solutions in a bit, but we should not accept this shaming because we are just naturally like this. They try and say we're animals, we don't control ourselves, this and that. No, we should control ourselves as much as we can, but we also acknowledge that this is a natural trial and an attraction that Allah gave us and we should never be ashamed for how Allah made us. Number two that they try and shame us for is wanting to have some sort of hierarchy in the household. So they say that men wanting to have authority in their household is a sign of controlling behavior. It's abusive, it's oppressive. What I would say is that us Muslim men, 
we are the protectors and maintainers of our women. And when you have that responsibility, yes, it is primarily something for us as Muslim men to see it as a responsibility, not as a privilege, but as a responsibility. When you have responsibility over things, you need to have some sort of authority to keep things under control and things in check so that those people you're supposed to be protecting, you can actually protect them. Imagine the military, their job is to protect the country, but they don't have any weapons. They don't have any power to make any decisions. They always have to ask someone else, can we buy a weapon? Can we go and protect the country? Can we pull this trigger to defend ourselves? Imagine that was the case, the military would be completely ineffective. And this is what they want to shame us into, into saying, yes, we take full responsibility for the women, we'll pay for the women, we'll pay for our wives and our family and all that, but no, we don't have any authority. No, authority must come with responsibility. They come together. And us Muslim men, I believe we see it like this anyway, that it's ultimately a responsibility. It's something that we are going to be held accountable for. But nonetheless, we should have that authority in the household. That is how Allah made it. Okay, number three is a big one, which is seeking respect. So they say, they try and shame us into this idea that you just have a fragile ego. Why do you want to be shown respect? Why are you so concerned about this? The truth is we want a harmonious family life. If you as a woman, the number one thing you crave from a marriage is affection or attention, then we accept that as your natural way and your natural instinct. And so we will give that to you as much as we can. But then when we say that the number one thing that we crave in a marriage is respect, that's really what we crave, respect. That's all we want from you, really. Now all of a sudden our ego is fragile and you're trying to judge what Allah naturally made us like. Ask any man, the number one thing, especially a married man, if he sits back and thinks about his marriage life, and when he's happy and when he's not happy with it, he will feel the happiest when he's being respected, ultimately. Now, you might not as a woman understand that, but we fully understand that we really appreciate respect. So just how we don't judge what you want and how Allah made you, you don't judge what we want and how Allah made us. So again, with the goal of having a harmonious, happy family, you need to give us the respect and we'll give you the affection and the attention that you crave and we'll all be happy. But to try and judge it, that's not going to go very far because we are not going to change the way we are. We're just like this. And of course, there are extremes of how people define respect, but just the base level of showing respect, giving a bit of authority, that is very reasonable to expect. Okay, the next one is very common, and that is that men should be more emotional and more open with their feelings. And it's because of their lack of emotions and their feelings being expressed that they commit suicide at higher rates and they have these problems and those problems. Again, judging what we are like and how we are naturally made based on your paradigm, your way of seeing the world. I would say this, look, we are naturally people who tend to turn inwards. We think things over. We try and solve problems when they come up ourselves. That's what most men are like. That's just how we are. Don't judge us. On the other hand, I've always been calling for men to be more open with their feelings or the problems they're going through with other men. And I think that's where a lot of the fruits come out. And it's not a strict thing. The Prophet ﷺ, he did confide in his wife with certain issues, but he was never like out of control. And he was going and he's just saying, oh, I have no idea what to do. No, he would have a specific issue he would go to her with, for example, with the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when he went to his wife and she suggested that he leads the people by example by shaving his head first. He did that. So he had a specific issue. He went to her. He actually sought counsel actively. He didn't just go to her and let everything out and then tell her, okay, fix it. No, that's not how it was. So for us, we might need to be more open with our emotions sometimes for our own good, but most likely we're not going to do it in a way that you think it should be done because we're not women. Isn't that crazy to say? We're not women, so we're different to women. And instead, we can come up with solutions that cater to how we naturally are. So yes, just because we don't want to go home and cry to our wives and collapse in front of her and express everything and vent and all of that and whine and complain, just because we don't do that, it doesn't mean we're toxically masculine or whatever. And then there's another weird one, which is the Prophet ﷺ clearly said that is a very good thing for a wife to be obedient to her husband. And there's many ayat and hadith that we can pull about this topic where generally the wife needs to get permission from her husband to do certain things, to do a lot of things. Now, we try to be shamed for seeking this type of authority or wanting this type of authority. And a lot of it just goes down to the fact that we talked about previously, which is that we want respect and we want a hierarchy in the house where if we're going to be responsible for you, we need some sort of compliance from you. The two things go hand in hand. If we have authority, we're responsible for you. But when we tell you, no, no, don't cross that road, it's dangerous, and then you don't listen to us, then how can we ultimately take care of you and be responsible? So yes, ultimately, we can't shy away from this at all because the Prophet said that a woman, if she prays her five daily prayers, she fasts the month of Ramadan, 
she guards her chastity and she obeys her husband, it will be told to her, enter Jannah from whichever gate you choose. So it's a very high rank, it's a very good thing to obey your husband. It's a very important, integral thing. But what we should see it from as a man is that now this is a big responsibility, that I can actually tell my wife what to do and she needs to obey it. Therefore, I have to be very careful about what we are telling our wives to do. And we have to be actually very forgiving and open about things. If we're not happy about something, we can't just say, do this and do it. We actually have to think deeply. When you have authority, it becomes a bit of a burden, to be honest. But that's what Allah gave us, and that's fine. We accept that. But you have to accept that position that ultimately comes directly from the Prophet ﷺ. And just because you're encouraged to be obedient, it doesn't mean it's an awful thing in the first place. Just because you have to obey, it's a bad thing. No, we know people who are obsessed with freedom for the sake of freedom. And then another one that comes up and it's a bit crazy these days is that if a man doesn't want his wife to work, he's oppressive somehow. Automatically he's oppressive, he's abusive even, which is very strong words. But apparently just because you desire your wife to be protected in her house, not mixing with criminals or random people in the street who who knows what they could do, not wanting her to go out to work and mix with non-mahram men, just because you don't want that, that's oppressive. This is the opposite of oppression. This is taking care of people that you're responsible for and ultimately being that chivalrous person who's taking care. And remember, a man knows what other men are like and a man should know what women are like as well. And therefore, he will know an appropriate setting for a woman to work in. So in Islam, we don't have some hardcore rule about you can work, you can't work. But what we should have is the input into if a woman is going to work, where she should work, the environment and all of that. And of course, a woman should hold herself accountable for that as well anyway. But the point is that just because we prefer to protect our women or for our women to be more in their natural nurturing roles of being at home and taking care of things like that, just because we prefer that, that is not abusive in and of itself. That's not oppressive. It's something that we prefer, again, for what? For the harmony of the family and for everyone to have their role in the right way. Imagine you had a company and all of a sudden you came and he said, look, all of the creative kind of people, you need to now work in accounting and all the accounting people, now you have to go and be creative. I know these are stereotypes that might hurt some people's feelings. But imagine you took people out of their correct roles that they are trained to do and they feel comfortable in that and you swap them. What is the outcome going to be for that organization? That is the same as in the family when you try and switch things around. So just because we want things in their kind of natural way, we don't have to be too rigid with it, of course, but just because we want that, we shouldn't be shamed for that. That's a natural thing that we have this ghira, this jealousy, this protective jealousy, that we don't want any harm to come to our people, our family. And the Prophet ﷺ, of course, praised the one who has that. Even when it comes to just going outside, never mind working, Aisha, when she would go out, she would actually be away from the street where the men were. She would be walking so close to the walls, away from the street, that her clothes would get caught on it. She was trying to keep away as much as she could. So she did go out, but when she went out, she was very careful in avoiding mixing as much as possible. So keep that in mind. So now these are the things that we are being shamed for. And I'm telling you, never feel shamed for things that naturally come in, especially when Allah and the Prophet ﷺ have told you that this is normal. This is natural. These are the guidelines to follow and we follow the guidelines. Never be ashamed of that. If you have a certain desire or certain idea that is foreign to Islam and Allah doesn't justify this in any way, Allah doesn't give you the authority to do this, that's different. That's something where you should think about it, have wisdom, and think about what's the good points and the bad points that could come out. But when it comes from Allah and His Prophet ﷺ, and it's something just natural in us, never be shamed. Never be shamed for feeling that way because this is from Allah. It's not our fault. And if it's backed up by Allah even more, then that's a next level of validation that we don't need to worry about what people say about us. And sometimes you might feel like all the women in the world, they won't validate you, they won't like you, they won't love you, they won't respect you because of your natural feelings. Those people are not worth taking from. You should take from the right sources that guide you on the right path, not any other path from any other foreign ideology. So what's the solution here? Number one, know very clearly in your head what is natural, what comes from Allah, what is prescribed by Allah and the Prophet when it comes to any of these matters that you feel shamed about, and then get that confidence that this came from Allah and this is forever. It's not some foreign ideology that's been around for just 20 years. Number two is actually to be humble. And to notice that, yes, I might have these feelings and those feelings need to be channeled in the right way. And if I'm not channeling them in the perfect way, that I should be humble and acknowledge that I'm not perfect and I'm trying my best actually. And you know what? You're right. That thing you said that you tried to shame me for that the Prophet said is not good. Yes, I should be shamed for that. I shouldn't follow, go down that path. 
So be humble and be open to improving your ways always when you're wrong. And number three, never let a foreign ideology that is not from the Sirat al mustaqim to sway and mess with your head. And a lot of this comes from consuming content that is from a foreign ideology and it confuses you. And even if you think, oh, I'll filter it out or this and that, it's very hard to constantly filter out and eventually it overpowers you. Nobody went on Twitter or these places thinking that, yeah, I want to have my mind changed about that thing or I want to feel ashamed about this natural thing. Nobody went on it with that intention, but that happened because that's what happens when you're constantly exposed to certain things. So just go back to the right sources and then gain confidence in what is right from an objective point of view, right? When we talk about coming from Allah and the Prophet that stuff is objective. It's not subjective, my opinion versus your opinion. No, this is from the creator of the heavens and the earth. So those are the solutions and that's great and all, but there is a problem that comes when you become confident in how you naturally are and you really only follow the right sources and you just go blind to these foreign ideologies. What happens is a lot of the women, unfortunately, will not be interested in you. And so if you're looking to get married, you might be wondering, well, what are the right types of women? And that problem is solved by this next video. So watch it to find out the types of women that you should be looking for when it comes to marriage.